Again, my name is John Runyon, and I am the Deputy Act Commissioner with uh, Merced County Act, uh, Act Commissioner's Office. So, some people were asking me if I was the Act Commissioner, and you can tell my hair is not gray enough yet. Uh, so if you're an Act Commissioner, you either have gray hair or no hair. So. Um, Marsha asked me to come out and just talk a little bit about, uh, just update you guys on the core power class and what's going on with that. So, um, I have, I think Pete's passing around uh, information packet that I kind of put together and it has uh, it has a letter that went out uh, we sent a letter out just informing growers in Merced County of the designation of Pyrofoss as a restricted material so a lot of you might know Pyrofoss is lower stand lock on govern new foss uh, materials like that can everybody hear me okay without the microphone what was that Okay. Uh, I'll hold it, hold it everything, so. okay. I need it. Um, anyways, this letter went out uh, back in June, and uh, what we did was we sent it to about 522 of our permittees here in Merced County, and we based that list on people who have used it for Pyrofoss in the past uh, past four or five years. So um, the letter just pretty much explained that for Pyrofoss was became a restrictive material of July 1st, 2015. And uh, what's going to happen, it becomes a California restricted material, which means that it has to be on a permit. Uh, if you have a grower uh, operator number, ID number, then you'd have to come in and get a restricted materials permit. And with a restricted materials permit, if you have an op ID number, you'd have to get a private applicator certificate to go along with that. So. Um, these are, once again, uh, with making it a restricted material, uh, interim permit conditions came along with that. Uh, the DPR released some interim permit conditions for Chlorpyrofos and in Merced County we went ahead and adopted those and so those are added on to everybody that comes in to get a permit in Merced County. Um, so that's what the letter pretty much said if you were going to be using the Chlorpyrofos after July 1st that you would need a restricted materials permit. You might need to come in and get a private applicator uh, certificate. And then also, uh, you would have to turn in NOIs when you use the chlorofirefoss material. So, um, in your information packet there, I did include the uh, list of California restricted materials, and you can see it's been updated uh, to include chlorofirefoss on that. So that has all the California restricted materials on there. Um, moving along to our permit conditions, uh, I've included those in your packet as well. And basically, the permit conditions are uh, they're, they're somewhat minimal. Uh, they include some language that is on is actually on the uh, label, but it's just been adjusted a little bit. Uh, we have some setback distances in there, and uh, if you look at a label, you'll notice that um, it, those setback distances are for aquatic sites. Well, in the permit conditions released by the DPR and the ones that we've adopted, they're actually for all sensitive sites. And in Merced County, sensitive sites can include uh, areas uh, such as schools, rural residential areas, urban residential areas. Um, of course, the sensitive aquatic sites also. Uh, hospitals, endangered species habitat areas, uh, labor camps, churches, daycare centers, things like that. So, um, I've highlighted uh, one small part that Merced County did make a little bit more restrict. And um, we would not allow uh, this product to be used if anyone is, a, is in a, one of these setback areas. Uh, the, there would be ex there are, could possibly be exceptions for handlers and vehicles and persons riding bicycles passing through the setback area on public or private roadways. Uh, but that's at the discretion of our department. So uh, up front, that's not allowed unless you contact us and we say it's okay. So, and that's pretty much basically the only change that we've made to the uh, Permit conditions that have been released by the DPR, so it's a, just a little bit, a little bit more restrict, a little bit more restricted than what the DPR released. So, uh, there is a couple things um, I wanted to go over on the label with you. Um, I've included the Lorispan Advanced label, and uh, that's pretty much basically very similar to a lot of the chlorpyrifos labels. Uh, just a couple things I wanted to point out that uh, for environmental hazards. Uh, Chlorpyrifos is, is uh, toxic to fish, aquatic invertebrates, small mammals, and birds. 
Uh, do not apply directly to water or to areas uh, where surface water. So again, that goes along with our permit conditions. Um, drift or runoff from treated areas may be hazardous to aquatic organisms and water adjacent to treated areas. So one thing about chlorpyrifos, it binds really well with soil. So you really have to watch the water that's coming off of, uh, off of those sites. Um, I think uh, the problems that they had with the surface water, that's been one of the, the main issues with it. It binds the soil and you get the uh, runoff going off into the surface water areas and that's where they're detecting a lot. Uh, some of it is from uh, overspray, but um, um, that's, I know talking with our water coalitions, that, that is one of the issues also with the fire flies. So. Uh, moving along through the label, um, the one thing that you do have to be aware about these labels, the, that it, it jumps back and forth from uh, the label language as precautions and restrictions, and then there is some mandatory language on there uh, for some of these for some of these restrictions. So for flood irrigation, there's a 24 hours following uh, following applications. Uh, you do not flood irrigate for 24 hours following a soil surface or foliar application of the horse band advanced. So on this label, and I think it's very similar for all the other labels. Um, Moving along, uh, as you can see, when you go through some of this language, uh, there, there is a, it jumps back and forth from advisory uh, sections that are advisory in nature. It does not supersede the mandatory label requirements. So there's mandatory label requirements and advisory in nature label requirements. So I would definitely advise everybody to use the uh, the advisories on this. Um, when you're, if, if problems were to happen, we would look at uh, the application itself and we would look at how it was applied. And if you went against the, the advisory statements on here, we would definitely look at that and that can you know, possibly be an issue for you if problems were to arise. Um, again, with the ground move applications, there's best management practices. And one thing I would like to say is uh, contact your local water coalitions in our letter that we put out. Uh, hopefully, if all of you are using Papyrus, hopefully uh, you, you did get that letter. Uh, there is some information about the water coalitions. The water coalitions are, are a great resource for best management practices, uh, especially for Papyrus. Uh, they do a lot of education uh, specifically on those areas, so definitely want to contact the uh, East San Joaquin Water Coalition or the West, uh, the West Side Water Coalition about that. So. Um, but those are just a couple things I wanted to point out in the label. Uh, again, the other thing, the only other issue I really want, wanted to remind you guys about was the, uh, the VOC, the non-fumigant VOC emissions and the uh, restrictions on those. So we are still in that uh, VOC period from uh, May 1st to October 31st that the high VOC products uh, on certain crops such as alfalfa and cotton are not allowed. There are, I did highlight some, some uh, points on there that you, you might want to look at. There is, a, there is an exception for clopyrifos to control aphids on cotton. If that were to happen, a, a recommendation has to be uh, submitted and, and uh, the recommendation must identify the exception on there. So, um, and that's what, we are, that's what we are looking for when we see these materials coming through also too. So. Um, and just a reminder that those use prohibitions will be in effect for uh, two years. So, and that's basically all I wanted to uh, remind you guys about. Um, one last thing I did include on there is uh, some information about electronic use reporting. So uh, if you're not aware of that, we do offer electronic use reporting. I know a lot of uh, the, the use reports come in through Agrian, but you can use our CalAg permit system too works pretty well. The nice thing about the CalAct permit system is that you can view all the information and, and the, uh, all, you can view information from the permit itself and also the NOIs and the use reports that are turned into the, to us. And so you can go back and look at your whole complete record, make sure all your agri and stuff is getting submitted properly, go back and look at the history of what you apply. So, um, that's about basically all I wanted to talk about. So, uh, you guys have any questions about any of the restrictions? Or yeah, yes, what's sir? the setback? Um, what's the setback? You talked about the setbacks from yeah. roads or 
It would be all. It would be sensitive, sensitive sites. Um, it's not limited to the sensitive sites that I mentioned, but those are those are most of them that I can think of. What's the distance? Uh, the distances are, are a little bit different for the depending on the application. So for ground boom applications, it'd be 25 feet. For chemigation, it'd be 25 feet. For air blast sprayers, it'd be 50 feet. And for the uh, aerial applications, it'd be 150 feet. So. But the important thing to note here is these are conditional permits. So if you look around here, it, you know, what is adjacent? By adjacent, I mean, I mean, I think you guys mean that would be an adjacent field? Yeah. So if there was a school there, obviously, that would be a sensitive area or water. But if this field doesn't have any of the, then it's, you know, then these. It wouldn't be any setbacks or anything. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, right. Correct. So that's why this whole thing is not, you know, it's only under those when you're adjacent to a sensitive area. And you can go to the commissioner and get that exemption. So. Gotcha. And again, those distances are actually pulled from the label. Um, and on the label, it says aquatic, aquatic sites. Uh, we've included all the sensitive sites with that. So, Sean, on the uh, aping material, what are some of those main product names? Uh, well, be you know the chlorpyrifos materials. I don't I don't know specifically if there's certain ones that people are using for aphids, but um, you know I don't know if it's Lorspan, Lock On, whatever. I'd have to go back and look at the use and see what people are actually using. On the yeah, my guess wouldn't be Lock On. Uh, that tends to be more of a war material, so it's probably going to be. Um, It'd be Lord's band. In this case, you couldn't do it in 4E, but it'd be uh, it'd be advanced, and then whatever some of the generics are governed, as you pointed out, probably. Well, you could use the you could use the Lord's band. There's the, the exception for on cotton. So. Well, those late season cotton. Yeah. So. And then there's there's quite a few products for for fire yeah. products. So. Um, probably wouldn't use them anyway. Yeah. So I think yeah. I want to say 12, but don't quote me on that. But. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean.